<laughs> oh man. Okay. In addition to what was said in terms of a bio, uh, I studied in Youngstown as well, a computer technology degree. And then when I relocated to Palestine, I was actually recruited and myself and another individual at the World Bank who was just appointed prime minister designate, Dr. Mohammed Mustafa. We went back to actually uh, create, establish the telecommunications company, which was the first time we ever were allowed to have a telecommunications company. Um, then I went off on my uh, side of things and did consulting and did an MBA at Tel Aviv University in marketing. Uh, he went back to the World Bank and then came back uh, and now is involved in the prime ministership position. Um, I have long left that company and did many things in between. Um, and in the meantime, or on the side, I, I follow politics very closely from even before uh, I relocated to Palestine. And I guess this presentation, I give every once in a while, and it's, I, I'm kind of happy that people are asking about Palestinian politics, because people sometimes don't respect that Palestinians have inner politics, domestic politics. It's always being imposed from us from outside. But we have a dynamic that we have to take in consideration. And that dynamic just got very complicated after October 7th, more than it was before. So I'll fly through a set of slides to try to give you the overall picture of the frame and structure of the internal Palestinian uh, setup. And then I'd be more than glad to try to answer some questions at the end. Thank you. Sounds great. Okay, let me just get this set up here. Everybody's a Zoom expert these days, including <laughs> me. There we go. You can see my screen. Yes. Okay. I'm going to make it full screen. You can see that as well? Yes. Okay. I start... And this was done before October 7th, this presentation. I start my presentation with Gaza. I've always started my presentations with Gaza because Gaza has been a powder keg for the last 16 years. And this is the picture that I happen to choose because it shows fishing, it shows buildings, it shows a shore. For me, Gaza represented and really still represents, even though it's much harder today, the future of Palestine because it is a Mediterranean uh, city just like anywhere around us, including in Italy, in Greece, in Cyprus, in Lebanon, we should be as attractive uh, to uh, tourists and others as any of those Mediterranean seashores. Of course, the occupation does not allow us to develop as such. And I had to add a slide or two since October 7th. This is what Gaza shore looks like today. Mind-boggling. I, I can't even absorb it still. Um, but this is what we're facing in terms of the ongoing plausible genocide, quote unquote, that is taking place uh, while we are watching live. But today's uh oh, uh oh, you're freezing up. Uh oh. You froze. Okay, one second. Can you hear me? Yes. Is my screen it, red and green? Yes. It didn't okay. freeze online. Okay. Okay. This is, uh, every time we want to discuss anything political, whether it's here in the States or in Palestine or anywhere, we need to put it within a political context or historical context. So I wanted to make sure I create the starting point of giving a historical context. Of course, one can always go further back in history, but there's some uh, milestones that are important to keep in mind. Ours, as you well know, uh, was the creation of the State of Israel and our Nekbe, our catastrophe, our refugeedom uh, started. 1967, we had what we call the Nekse, uh, which is a setback. Um, and that's when the occupation took uh, the West Bank, uh, Gaza and East Jerusalem. And then we had the first Intifada, and in 1988, the Palestinian leadership, uh, uh, Palestinian legislative body at the time, uh, the PLO, uh, actually declared uh, independence, even though there was not independence on the ground, but they declared the intent of the Declaration of Independence. This is an important couple page document worthy of reading. It's the first time the Palestinians put in writing, uh, for me rather clearly, some would say it's vague, uh, the acceptance of the state of Israel. It was embedded within this document. Um, and in 1991, the Madrid conference 
actually the beginning of Oslo started in Madrid. The a set of Palestinian leaders inside the occupied territory. The picture here is Dr. Haider Abdel Shafi, who was the lead uh, Palestinian negotiator, uh, went to Madrid and for the first time ever met Israelis uh, on a negotiating table. Um, at that time, Israel refused to allow the Palestinians to be represented by themselves. So the Palestinian delegation was embedded in the Jordanian delegation. So how did they make themselves known? Uh, if you recall the infamous, the famous picture of Saab Erdakat wearing the Palestinian kafiyeh. So although they weren't allowed to be there as a separate delegation, they signified that they were Palestinian component of the Jordanian delegation by wearing the kafiyehs during the negotiation process. While they were negotiating, in the open, uh, we were watching it on CNN, happening every day, wondering what's going to happen. Arafat had started backdoor negotiations in Oslo with the Israelis, first time ever, directly speaking to the Israelis, and that produced something in 1993 called the Oslo Accords. It's actually a set of documents, and that surprised everyone. It surprised the Palestinian negotiators that were at Madrid and everyone else who was involved. Um, Interesting, it didn't happen in the U.S. It happened in Oslo, Norway. Uh, and that says something. When the U.S. is away from direct contact with the parties, the parties seem that they can uh, find ways to find common ground, at least back then. Oslo started. Um, Oslo is a weekend read. If you want to read the actual document, as I have many times, uh, it's worthy of reading because it tells you a lot, not everything, but a lot about why we are at the low point that we are today and why things basically fell apart. Uh, in 2000, o Oslo was a five-year agreement. It had a, it had a date on it. It was like milk. I mean, after a specific date, it was going to spoil. Uh, <laughs> our Oslo Accords had a five-year uh, use-by date. And after the five years passed, it stayed intact, but it started to smell. The parties stopped... <laughs> stopped actually complying by it. Uh, the Palestinians continued to try to comply as much as possible and leverage it. The Israelis just brushed it aside from day one, and we can talk about that later. In 2000, the Clinton administration convinced Arafat uh, to come to the Camp David summit. This is not the Camp David summit in the 70s, but the one in the 2000. The 70s was the Camp David Accords that brought peace between Egypt uh, and Israel. This one was supposed to bring peace between Palestinians and Israelis. Arafat at the time, very shrewd politician, uh, told Clinton, the Israelis are not ready for this. They can't deal with an agreement. They don't have the ability to give what's needed to meet our bare minimum. And Clinton convinced Arafat, come to the summit, try your best, and if it doesn't work, I promise you, I will not blame either side. And Arafat entered with that assumption. When after a couple of weeks, Camp David failed, uh, completely collapsed. The first press release Clinton did was to come up and say that Arafat is responsible for the collapse. This was shocking to all of us. I mean, you just promised us that if we go through the process and try our best, that we might not reach an agreement and you wouldn't blame anyone. That's something to be uh, noted in history. Second Intifada started at that break, and you can see these uh, black things up here, the jagged, uh, that's where things basically fell apart, and Israel re-entered in a heavy military way all of the Palestinian cities again, uh, and uh, many, many people died during the Second Intifada. It was an armed Intifada. Unlike here, the First Intifada, which was mostly nonviolent, uh, this First Intifada is the where the word was coined, um, and I'm not sure we should use it for the second, because the second was actually a armed conflict between the two sides. After 12 years passed, when uh, nothing happened, I mean, the Israelis continued to operate militarily, and the Palestinian side said, if we just keep sitting here doing nothing, the Israelis continue to keep building settlements, there'll be nothing left to negotiate in a couple years. So the Palestinian side went to uh, the UN and got some was awarded. Uh, at their request, a non-member observer status at the UN. And I'll get to that in a second as well. But that's the overall historical context that we need to keep this story in mind. So very quickly, when we look at uh, what Palestine, 
is today, we're talking about a difference between an open society that was able to maneuver back and forth. Uh, and today we're talking about a society which is on the right here, total fragmentation, total. This map is obscene. I mean, these are representative of areas A, areas B, the orange areas are off limits. These are military zones. You have settlements in here. You have bypass roads. This is not anything close to a state. This is something which is called Swiss cheese and Israel is the cheese and we're all the holes in the cheese. Uh, this is the reality that Oslo created for us. So when Palestinians are critical about Oslo, uh, they have a right to be. Um, the map on the left shows where the refugees ended up after 1967. And that's the beginning of the fragmentation. You had Palestinians that ended up in Lebanon and Syria and in Jordan and Egypt. Uh, and in, of course, in Gaza. So fragmentation has been a, a theme uh, since Israel was created until today. And we should keep that in mind as well. Move forward here. So the when Israel was created, the Palestinians in 1964, the year I was born, in Egypt, uh, created something called the Palestine Liberation Organization. Remember, this was created before the occupation of the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. So in 1964, the goal of this organization was, we want to go back home. We were hit by this foreign party that came with a military force and established their state, and we ended up as refugees. And the goal at that time was to have our refugees go back home. And that was the starting of the PLO. What's the, What's the PLO? And I won't go through this in detail, but I'll I'll just give you a brief of the, what this looks like. This the, the highest body. You're still on the slide with the refugees. Is that where you okay. want to be? No, it's going to come up with an organizational chart here in a second. Sometimes it takes a sec. Did that come up? Technology is great, except when it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll work here in a sec. Let me go back one and see if I can make it come back up. Is it showing on your end? Yes, it does on mine. Should I stop my screen share and then reactivate it? Uh, your screen sharing is paused. That's why. One second. Why is it paused? There's something going on here. Excuse me, one second. Screen sharing is paused. How do you unpause? I will stop that screen sharing and do it again from my side. And it should be working. I don't know why it stopped. Better? Yes. Okay. Let me just close this. All righty. Okay. So this is this is the structure of the PLO. I mean, the PLO, people talk about it not knowing exactly what it's made up of. And this is the dynamic that everyone keeps pointing to. So the, the, the highest body in the PLO, similar to our Congress, is the Palestine National Council. And this organ, this body, this legislative body, is made up of, on the left here, popular organizations. There's an organization, we can call them unions for all different kinds of things in our community, workers, women, students, teachers, journalists, et cetera. I actually got involved in Palestinian politics through the General Union of Palestinian Students called GUPS, abbreviated GUPS, G-U-P-S, at Youngstown's State University. I mean, they had a chapter of GUPS, which means we actually were electing people to represent us in this body of the Palestine National Council. So popular organizations are one component of the PLO. On the right-hand side here are, are the political parties. And these are similar to Democrats and Republicans. We have many political parties that make up the PLO. Sadly, these have not been renewed since 1960s. And that's a big complaint that I have in terms of the political system is not open. If I decided I wanted to create a new political party today, there's nowhere to go sign up. 
So that's what makes up, in, in addition to the top here, of independence. So you're either from a political party or you're part of a political popular organization, or you're an independent that is elected into the Palestinian National Council. That's the PLO. And then when the PLO meets, sadly, they don't meet very often, sometimes 20 years between meetings, which is doesn't make sense. Uh, but that's what dictators and autocrats expect. They want a structure, but they don't want the structure to operate. And that's exactly how it's been operating for the last two decades. When they're not in session, the PLO Central Council takes over and meets on a more regular basis and actually calls the shots. And they have an executive committee that meets even more regularly. And that executive committee produces a chairman, uh, which was what Arafat's role was, and today what uh, Mahmoud Abbas's role is. And then if you can see here, the chairman actually runs uh, several departments, um, which is the military side of things. And the executive committee collectively runs all of the uh, departments, let's say, of uh, uh, the PLO. Interesting, the chairman himself, kind of like our commander in chief role, has full control over the military part of whatever we have as military uh, efforts within the PLO. So that's the PLO in a in a nutshell. Uh, something to keep in mind. Moving forward. Do you see that? Yep. yep. Okay. Moving forward, um, the PA, what, what is called, many people confuse or conflate between the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is the overarching umbrella that it captures all Palestinians, whether you're in Youngstown, Ohio, or in Ramallah, the PLO is the body that represents you. However, Oslo, the peace process that has now expired, produced another body called the Palestinian Authority. Palestinians call it the Palestinian National Authority. Uh, and that Palestinian Authority is an administrative body, only administrative, to oversee the affairs of what happens in the occupied territory. So basically, they oversee things from an administrative perspective of the Palestinians living in these red areas. These red areas here are the Palestinian population centers and Gaza. Uh, and they have their own legislative branch, prime minister, and judicial branch. It's the formation of a structure more towards a government uh, as we're heading towards a state. Uh, however, the negotiating uh, party is not the Palestinian Authority. Remember, I said it's administrative. The negotiating party is the PLO. So when the U.S. wants to give funds to the Palestinian side, they don't give it to the Palestinian Authority. They give it to the PLO. And uh, if required, they earmark the funds for a specific project or some or a payroll for the Palestinian Authority. But the PLO is the what we call, and this is a very important trick word, the political agency of the Palestinians. Um, this person here on the left is the current prime minister. He's exiting and the new prime minister is entering. And this is our president who refuses to leave office. I'll get to that in a second as well. So uh, when we look at the Palestinian security uh, structure, and I'm not a security person, but because this is so uh, important when people speak about what's going on, the president actually has a prime minister is responsible for the national uh, minister of interior, which has everything to do with the internal security forces, the traffic police, the intelligence, uh, uh, things like that. And on the left-hand side, the president, as I said earlier, has a direct uh, influence over the general intelligence service and the presidential guard. But remember, the president appoints a prime minister. So ultimately, he's only outsourcing the operation of all the other stuff to a prime minister, but he's in charge at the end of the day. So there's many different uh, uh, bodies of security. Uh, many are uh, redundant uh, and many times by design. Arafat was known to create a redundant system. So he asked you, what's the weather like today? And then he asked the guy next to you, what's the weather like today? And the guy next to you, and then he makes sure that everybody's talking about the same thing so nobody can gang up on him. Uh, again, a, an element of uh, an autocratic government. In 1974, to st take a step back, uh, the General Assembly actually recognized that body, that political agency, as the representative of the Palestinian people. And that is our uh, uh, 
the PLO's logo, and it became uh, recognized uh, in the General Assembly, which means we had a table, we had a desk, we had a voice, we can hear what was going on. Um, and then in November 74, the PLO was granted observer status, not the state, but the PLO, the representative body. And uh, the PLO has established a permanent observer mission since 1974, which mean, means something. I mean, the, the, the international community understood that the Palestinians had some kind of special status. Um, actually, they were understanding that we were heading towards statehood. And I think this was an incremental step to get us there. And then... In the 15th of December, 1988, it's when the Palestinians actually declared statehood, uh, the status was changed from the PLO to Palestine. And that's also very significant because as I said, the international system kind of saw us heading towards statehood and they incrementally upgraded our status along the way. In 88, if you recall, is when we issued our Declaration of Independence and when on the ground, the first Intifada was happening. So we became uh, Palestine in the face of the UN. And then uh, if I take another step back, uh, in 2011, as the Oslo process was collapsing uh, and the Palestinians said, what are we gonna do? We can't just wait, nobody's doing anything. The US is not in, in influencing Israel to move us towards statehood. So the Palestine Liberation Organization took a very healthy decision to go to the UN and Asked the highest multilateral body in the world and tell them Oslo has failed. Are Palestinians worthy of a state or not? And we did that. We first went in 2011 to the Security Council. We thought timing was perfect because President Obama was in office at the time, and we knew that he understood our case very well. Not only is he a constitutional lawyer, but he was... Uh, uh, trying to take on the Israelis in terms of stopping settlements, and basically was beaten up. So he, he understood what was going on. We thought, let's use that. So when we went to the UN Security Council and asked for upgrading from Palestine to the state of Palestine and have full membership in this club called the United Nations, we were shocked that the Obama administration said, if you bring this to vote, we will veto it. And we, we couldn't understand why. I mean, it's the U.S. that keeps talking about two states, two states, two states. They recognize one of the states. Why would they not recognize the second state? Remember, this is the same discussion happening today, by the way. So we became smarter. And uh, basically, the Palestinians told Obama, oh, you must have heard us the wrong way. Did we say we want to bring it for vote? We're bringing it to the Security Council so we can go into a committee to be researched. So we bought some time by putting it in the committee. It's actually sitting in that committee until today. We waited a full year. And in 2012, we, uh, in, before 2000, in October 2001, after that happened, uh, we understood that the different organs of the UN have different membership requirements. And the easiest membership requirement is the UN body called UNESCO, which is responsible for education and science and culture. Of course, it's it's broad because they want everyone to be part of UNESCO. So we went to UNESCO and we said, we're not a member state yet, but we're recognized as Palestine. Are we allowed to actually uh, submit an application to become a member of UNESCO? And they said, yes. Took them no time. Within a month, we were recognized by UNESCO as a member of UNESCO. And that drove Israel crazy. I mean, how can we start using uh, the UN system to our benefit? But we did. And then when we saw that that went positive in 2012, we went back to the General Assembly, not the, not the Security Council, but to the General Assembly. And we said, world, the Security Council said they will not pass this, so we're coming to you. Are we worthy of a state or not? Interestingly, 138 countries said yes, nine said no. And I list them there, Canada, Israel, Micronesia, Peru, the US, Czech Republic, Marshall Islands, Nauru, and Panama. Four of those are Pacific Islands that can fit in my living room. This was a historic missed opportunity. Whereas in Oslo, in the Declaration of Independence, there was a vague uh, rec recognition of the state of Israel. When the Oslo process started, the Palestinians put in writing 
uh, formally that they recognized the state of Israel. So we made a big concession at the beginning of Oslo. And here in this uh, resolution that we wrote up, and you can actually read it, and I'll show you where you can find it later, um, our four-page resolution clearly states that we're looking for a state in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza, and the border between us and Israel needs to be negotiated. A very um, advantageous position for someone wanting to recognize two states and still have flexibility to define a border. And um, I think the U.S. and Israel both, both missed a historic opportunity here. Move forward. And uh, the U.N. has a book. It's called the Blue Book. Whenever the body of the U.N. designates a territory as a state, they place it in the Blue Book. So the Blue Book is kind of like the Bible of, of states. And if, you know, if you're ordering something on Amazon or somewhere and you click a, uh, the country button and it comes down and lists all the countries, what companies should be doing, because the formal thing that would uh, make sense is they just list all the countries in the blue book because it's not Amazon or LinkedIn or any other company uh, responsibility to actually define who's a state and not. The UN defines who's a state and not. So even though we are as Palestine listed in the Blue Book, uh, it's very, very awkward that companies are still refusing to list Palestine in the uh, drop-down country boxes. I've actually written to LinkedIn about this. Um, you know, they, they instead of Palestine, they list Palestinian Authority. And I, I, I chuckle with myself, and I, I wrote an article, and I said, uh, do, you, do you list for the U.S. Uh, Bush administration or Trump administration, uh, or do you list the country's name? Because you're mixing apples and oranges here. Um, but that blue book is important in the bigger picture of things. Uh, remember, we're doing this, and the U.S. refuses to ad admit us in the U.N. and refuses to recognize us bilaterally. But we're still moving forward. Um, and then we learned that when the U.N. upgraded us and those 138 countries said yes to Palestine, that we are allowed to sign different treaties. And there's hundreds of treaties in the world about everything you can think about. So we said, oh, that's neat. We're going to start signing treaties. And we did this very purposely because we understood that Congress, way back during the Clinton time, actually legislated itself in a corner. They said, if Palestine becomes a member in any UN agency or treaty, we will cut off funding to that UN body. So when we became a member of UNSCO, UN uh, this, the, the education uh, uh, unit, the US actually stopped funding UNSCO, which means because we were entered into UNSCO, somebody in sub-Saharan Africa didn't get a book that year because the US cut their funding to UNSCO, which is about 30% of the organization's funding. So we understood how powerful this issue of treaties is. And we started entering treaties. And we started telling the Americans, we think you should recognize us. Because if not, we may want to enter the treaty of the transportation agency and the airline uh, regulations. And if you start withdrawing from that, how are your planes going to navigate? How are your ships going to navigate? So we, this very tiny place called Palestine put the US in a very awkward position. Um, more about that later, but even though they withdrew from UNESCO, 10 years later, they came back to UNESCO, even though we're still a member there. So it's actually the US falling over itself and then finding itself in a position that it has to come back to these international bodies if they wanna be part of the world. I've written much about the Palestinian uh, state of affairs. This was written uh, a while back. And basically I wrote an open letter to the Palestinian president and I told him that he needs to, um, and this was back in 2000, what is it, 21 maybe, uh, that you need to appoint a deputy. You're getting old. And if you pass away, there's going to be a vacuum. And I told him back then, you also need to go to Gaza. It doesn't make sense that this division between Hamas and Fatah, and you are the president supposedly of the PLO, which is representing everyone, and you refuse to visit Gaza. That was way back when. Um, I, I imposed on him to uh, try to enact a political party law, 
because I think new parties should be able to be created and many other things here that I did. The idea was that we need, and the last one may be the, the most important, the last two, which is you need to lead our solidarity movement. We have a very, and you guys are part of it, of a solidarity movement that's very bright, very active, very clear-minded. The only thing they miss is the National Liberation Movement's leadership of where they should be heading. Uh, is it one state? Is it two states? Is it cutting funding? It's the Palestinian leadership who should be giving marching orders to the movement, and they don't do that. And the, the last thing is, take the U.S. seriously. We look at APAC, we, we look at the pro-Israeli lobby, and we can see very transparently today how much they influence US, the U.S. political system. And I think the U.S. is open game for anybody that organized themselves properly. And I tell the Palestinian leadership, you've never taken the U.S. seriously. You think, because you have access to the White House, that that's America. And I tell them, this is not an Arab country. In an Arab country, you go to the palace and everything is taken care of. Nobody can say anything. Here, you, know, you go to the president. The president is only a president in the U.S. You know, if the president walks into McDonald's and tells them, I don't like your red tables, the owner of McDonald's tells them, go to hell, go to Burger King. Uh, in the Arab world, if you tell that to a, a, an owner, the next day the tables are changed. So the, the Palestinian leadership doesn't understand the dynamic, uh, complicated reality of the U.S. and the openness of the U.S. to actually work. And I'll let you read that article if you want. In ending here, I'm part of a strategy group, and this was done several, maybe 2000, I want to say, maybe 18, 19. We brought Palestinians from all walks of life to try to think forward in terms of, in 2030, what are our scenarios? Where are we heading? And we called the report a decade of clarity and renewal. We had no idea October 7th is when it was going to happen, but we had three scenarios that the Palestinians would probably focus on, and all three may be working together as well. The first one is reciprocity. Everything that Israel does to us, we're going to do it to them. Uh, so uh, including if they enter our, our, our camps and arrest people and, and, and dig up our infrastructure and shoot our youth, we're going to do the same to them. That happened for many years now, especially with this right-wing Israeli government. For the first time ever, when the jeeps and tanks rolled into our cities and, and camps, uh, they found Palestinians willing to shoot back. The second is renewal. That one has been taking much longer of a time to bring together. Uh, for better or for worse, it's actually coming together as we speak. October 7th has forced the Palestinians that are divided politically to talk about coming back together. It's actually happening right now. Hopefully they will come back together and create a unified leadership that gives clear direction. Uh, if they don't, things are gonna be worse than ever. And the third option that we learned in talking to the different people from Palestinian walks of life was that if everything else fails, and actually if everything doesn't fail, we may consciously want to go for full circle. What does full circle mean? It means we try to recognize Israel. We recognize Israel. They refuse to recognize us. They refuse to end the occupation. The international community refused to stop supporting and funding them and their settlements. So the Palestinian side at one in one day may say, you know what, Israel? You win. You get it all. We don't want a state. Maybe we're too weak to create a state. So you get the West Bank, you get Israel, you get West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem, uh, you get all the water, you get all the telecommunication frequencies, we'll even throw in Gaza for free, and you know what else you get? Us. That is a doomsday scenario for Israel, because the day the Palestinians stop demanding statehood, it's the day that this struggle moves from a national liberation movement to a civil rights movement. And believe me, next time I give you a talk, if we're at that point, it's much more easier for me to talk to you about a civil rights movement, especially if I go down in the south of the U.S. I just say, do you think we have the right to sit on the same bus or the same cafeteria counter as a Jewish person? And I think that would resonate. Up until today, the Palestinians are still claiming statehood, uh, and this will probably be the last uh phase before Palestinians will give up on statehood. The U.S. and Israel should hear those words very, very carefully uh, because their entire model 
of uh, wanting a two-state solution will fall apart if the Palestinians say, we tried, it didn't work, we don't want a state anymore. So um, th these are 2023 stats, uh, but I, I, I don't want to go through them, but I just want to give an indication. When Abbas is uh, competing against Hamas's leader in 2023, uh, Abbas loses. Hamas has had a popular support uh, for the last many years now. Um, however, when Barghouti, uh, Marwan Barghouti is a leader of Fatah that was imprisoned in the second intifada in the 2000 time. He's been in prison now for 20 plus years. Uh, and when he is put into the polls, even while he's in prison and runs, and the options are Haniye, which is Hamas, and Barghouti, Barghouti gets 60%. Barghouti is currently on the top of the negotiating list to be released in order for the hostages that Israel has in Gaza to be released. This is a very political move. If Barghouti is released, all of a sudden we have a younger Palestinian leader from the Fatah movement that might be able to you know, put Humpty Dumpty back together again and, and get the Palestinian political body working. Uh, so that's that's rather interesting. Um, same thing here. This is basically uh, support for a two-state solution. Uh, after October 7th, these numbers have, of course, changed. Uh, with Palestinians, uh, the, the two-state solution is moving further away uh, because people are seeing on the ground that Israel keeps eating up with the settlements more and more land. So reality is informing us that two states is becoming a, a model for something that can't be implemented. I don't believe that, but I can talk about that later. On the Israeli side, it's a mix. This has also changed since 2022. You're talking about a far right-wing government has been elected over several years. Uh, so you have more and more Israelis which are saying, uh, we don't want to live with a Palestinian state. We want to live in an apartheid state, and we're okay with that. That's problematic. In ending, I'll just look, point to two quotes. Uh, one is Dov Weisglass. He's an Israeli. He was, he's a businessman, he's a lawyer, he was an advisor to one of the Israeli prime ministers. And he was telling people, uh, don't worry, you can, we, we received a no one to talk to certificate. One of the models that the Israelis created is there's nobody to talk to. There's Hamas, there's Fatah, there's Sam, there's Ahmed, there's Muhammad, we don't know who to talk to. So he basically said, uh, we will not have to talk to the Palestinians until Palestine becomes Finland. And then someone who for sure you know, which is David Friedman, uh, and he once said, while he was ambassador of the U.S. to Israel, uh, you don't have to live with that Palestinian state, the issue of two states. You have to live with the Palestinian state when the Palestinians become Canadians. And my message to these people is, can you just leave us alone and allow Palestinians to be Palestinian inst instead of trying to make us out to someone else? And this picture I always ended with, this was created a long time ago. It's the kids of Gaza. And I always said that these kids deserve better. I don't know if these kids are alive or not, or under the rubble today, or are trying to get fed today. This breaks my heart. I mean, Gaza is not what you see on TV. Gaza is a very vibrant, youthful uh, community. More than 50% are under the age, I think, of 16. You're talking about a kid's community being bombarded. And I go back and say, we will rebuild Gaza to be better than this. And with your help, we'll end this occupation. I hope I didn't go on for too long. Thank you very much. We've got about um, 10 minutes, eight minutes. Um, questions, Ron? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, why did Obama back away? And then also Clinton did the same thing. Why did Obama back away? And then he said Clinton did the same thing. How do you explain that? That's an excellent question. You know, I had the same question myself. And I, I, I read a book that came out about 10 years ago. It's by two professors in the U.S., uh, John Mershmeyer and uh, uh, Stephen Walt, I believe the names are. The name of the book is The Israel Lobby. I highly, I, I actually went back last month and reread that book. It's a it's a big book. If you're an American, you must read that book 
to understand how broken the U.S. political system is. And we we know that. I mean, we're seeing it live today. APAC, the pro-Israeli lobby, um, when Trump lost the election, actually understood they need to do something more than just lobbying. And they created two super PACs, which actually today directly put money into campaigns of people who are pro-Israel, blindly pro-Israel. When you read this book, you will understand that Obama, Clinton, me, you, it doesn't matter. The deep state in the U.S. is structured in a way, very short-term mindset. When, when a congressman or a senator wins an election, the first thing on his mind is not to serve you as a citizen. It's to make sure he does everything right to be elected in four years. And the Israeli side understood that and has abused it to the maximum. So if the short answer is the pro-Israeli lobby in the U.S. has such a stranglehold on the U.S. political system that we can see a president today saying that uh, they support Israel 100 percent. They send them arms. They send them billions of dollars and they drop some food baskets on top of Palestinians' head, which is a nice photo op, but means nothing in terms of famine. So they can have this hypocrisy, but they will not do anything to disrupt their support to Israel. Otherwise, Israel cannot exist as a state. Uh, and I don't say Israel should not exist as a state, but I, th I, I, I do think that the noose should be taken off the U.S. political neck so we can serve our strategic interest by making sure Israel doesn't embarrass us in the Middle East, embarrass us in the international community, and take our money and do things like genocide against another people. That should not be allowed. And I think that's, in a way, where if we hold Israel accountable, we are saving Israel from itself. It's like telling your friend not to drive drunk, right? We are going to save Israel from falling off the cliff by holding it accountable. That's tough love, and that's what's needed right now. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Could you say something more about the fragmentation of the Palestinians and and what do you think the prognosis of that is post-October sure. 7th? Absolutely. The fragmentation actually starts with my first slide, which is the geographic fragmentation. In 1948, about uh, more than half of our community became refugees and not allowed to come back home. So that was the first geographic fragmentation. Where over years, Israel cut up the West Bank and made these Bantu stands, the colored picture with all the dots in it, the Swiss cheese, and the Palestinians, to move from one area of the West Bank to another area of the West Bank, have to cross Israeli checkpoints, Israeli mounds, and dirt mounds, and so forth. So the, the fragmentation became not only refugees out of Palestine, but became Gaza from the West Bank, East Jerusalem from Gaza. The West Bank is fragmented amongst itself. With that fragmentation in place for decades and being fine-tuned every day, it was only a matter of time before the Palestinian political body couldn't hold itself together again. I mean, when you want to have a meeting, like at the church you're in, you call people to come for a meeting. When we want to call for a meeting, we can't get to a single hall because of the fragmentation. I can't get to Nablus today. I need a four to five hour drive to go 45 minutes if I can get there. Um, so that fragmentation, in addition to Israel having a policy over the years, these days it's being accelerated by the hundredth degree, of assassinating and arresting Palestinian leaders. So every time a Palestinian leader emerges, and this happened in the 80s a lot, uh, they would be assassinated. And they don't shy away from saying it. They actually take pride that they have this very sophisticated ability to kill people in Lebanon and Qatar and other places, or Emirates and other places. Um, that led us to have a division. When we had elections back in 2006, the Americans said, Arafat's no good, you have to have elections. So we had elections. After Arafat, I think, was murdered, but passed away, we had elections. Abbas won the elections. And then he became president. The next elections was for the parliament. And uh, Hamas, for the first time ever, said, we, we're going to run. Up until that point, they didn't run an election because they didn't accept Oslo. But I guess because Arafat was no longer in the picture, they thought they had some leverage. So they said, we're going to run this time. Okay. So Abbas basically went to the Americans and said, Hamas wants to run. What should I do? And the Americans said, that's great. They've accepted Oslo. Let them run. So we had 
and Jimmy Carter actually came. God bless him. I hope he has uh, final days which are actually peaceful. Um, he came with an election monitoring team, and they monitored our elections in 2006. And surprise, surprise to everybody, including myself, Hamas won. Hamas won the parliamentary elections. And what did the U.S. do? They accepted Hamas to run. They accepted the U.S. the the U.S. Uh, team that came, saying that this was a proper democratic election. They just didn't accept the result, and then they boycotted the Palestinian government. Wouldn't that be great in the U.S. if we can support democratic elections, but when Trump wins, we can just say we don't accept it? That doesn't work that way. You have to accept who wins the election. So Hamas never had one day of actually being able to govern. Um, and I'm not a supporter of Hamas. But if I accepted four years of Bush and four years of Trump, I can accept four years of Hamas. I actually think they don't know how to govern and they would have fell on their own weight. But they didn't get that opportunity. So Gaza became under the control of Hamas and the West Bank became under the control of Abbas and his party Fatah. And that has been the case until now. Hamas did October 7th, shook up the entire world. And now the discussion is how do we come back together in one political body so we can actually be not only unified, but able to be able to rebuild Gaza because Gaza is in need of everything today. So it's a long story, but Israel has a very direct hand in making sure our fragmentation was embedded in a very serious way. Thank you. Oh, there's somebody on the chat. On the chat. Yes, I, I have a question if we have time. Hi, last um, last question. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, Mr. Bahur, you mentioned that um, they benefit from the PLO existing but not functioning. Can you clarify a little bit on who they is in this case? Who benefits from that? Sure. I think I was speaking of the U.S. at the time. They accepted that the PLO represents the Palestinians, so there's some kind of body that they can influence, uh, but they don't want that body to become a state, even though it's the U.S. that continues to call for a two-state solution. Remember, when you say two-state solution, two states. One, Israel, was recognized back in 1948, 11 minutes after it was declared. What is taking the U.S. so long to recognize the other state? So then we can have negotiations as two states. So I believe the U.S. benefits by having a political agency called the PLO that they can then influence, send funding to, cut funding from, and so forth. But they don't want it to become so proper that it merges into a state. Because remember, the PLO's goal today is to create a state. Um, so I think that they play us off on each other. But ultimately, what the discussion is right now at the White House is, are you ready to declare your recognition to the Palestinian state? If you don't, then the indication that you are giving this Israeli government is there's no state. Continue to build settlements. Continue to do whatever you want to do. And that's what's coming out of the White House today and out of Congress today. And it's mind boggling. And it's going to come back to the bite the U.S. I mean, it's going to come back. It's already biting you as and me as U.S. citizens by sending billions of dollars and, and in a little bit, we're going to send our boots to the ground to create some kind of floating port. Uh, so we are actively engaged in this. Um, but it's going to come back and bite the U.S. because the Palestinians one day, my, my children's generation, will say, Dad, you tried, Grandpa tried, Great Grandpa tried to create a state. It's not working. We don't want a state. We just want our civil rights inside the river to the sea. And when that happens, the entire mantra of two states is going to fly out the window because there's nobody else on the other side. If they think that through, they will see how complicated that will be for them. For Palestinians, we can accept either. We can accept two states, and we have in principle. And if it doesn't work, we have no problem going back from the river to the sea. That's where we started from, remember? So it's uh, it's more dangerous than they think. I'll end just by saying my uh, blog uh, is epalestine.ts. And there you will find my writings. And on the right-hand column, you'll find the documents that I spoke about, the Declaration of Independence, the UN uh, resolution that got our statehood and so forth. So I encourage you, all my social media links are there as well. My kids taught me all the social media platforms. So if you connect to me, I'll connect back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I may share with them at another point, the, the Daily Show with um, John Stewart and John Oliver back when Excellent. the U.S. pulled out from UNESCO, because I Excellent. think that that's Excellent. a um, really kind of tragic and yet 
well done piece. But thank you very much. Thank you for my, joining my us. My pleasure. My pleasure. And as Greg knows, I am one of the few Palestinians that will, re will reply to your email. So if you have any lingering <laughs> questions, feel free to send them my way. Have thank a good you. day. Bye -bye. Have a good day. <laughs> All right. I'm going to end that. End.